Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers from the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Oh yeah, and we're live at Purdue. Woo! Yeah. All right. Uh, This is a a fun little live podcast, mainly because I'm not in my cramped bedsty apartment with no windows. And this is great because I'm not in your cramped bedsty apartment. With no windows. We have these nice cushions. I'm really nice. Oh my these are gosh. Really, really good Can chairs. we keep these? Are these ours now? Great. Thank you. Um, but yeah, we are doing a live podcast at Purdue right now. We have, uh, I'm sure, several listeners who have never heard this podcast before. So yeah, yeah what's this podcast about, James? This podcast is about the minor details of industrial design. Where we sweat the small stuff. Yeah, we, I mean, we sometimes talk about major details. Yes, we do. And even micro details. And even minor, minor details. Oh, my gosh. Um, I will say, we also answer questions every episode. So I want you guys to start thinking of good design questions <laughs> right now. Um, because we will have questions. And usually, James and I get to vet the questions over email. So, like, we get rid of all those those crazy questions but this time it's yeah. it's open yeah ask you, ask away yeah uh now nick what are we doing at purdue um this is for the converge conference it's yeah. a i believe student run com- uh conference at purdue and uh, we are doing w- uh, podcasts and we also did some workshops yes we did how, how did your workshop go by the way my workshop was good i sketched a chair did the yeah. d- digital sketch demo had a lot of great questions about how how to sketch uh, and convey your ideas for different purposes, you know, whether it's for a client or if you want to do more illustrative sketching. Um, but yeah, cool. I saw your demo. How yeah, I, I'm I'm sorry, Nick. I didn't go to yours. Okay. I went to Ted's. I went to a TED talk <laughs> by by Teddy, uh, and uh, learned how to do sketch notes. Nice, um, nice. But how was my talk? I thought it was great. I got to sit in. I missed your workshop last time. I think we, you did your workshop at Square One. I believe that was the last time I remember that you had the, the workshop that I was there. But I really enjoyed it. You had a lot of energy to your, to your talk. You did the sketching on the go. Yeah. Where you sketch with your phone and your I, finger. Yes. And that's always <laughs> amazes me. Yeah. I'm working on, uh, on, on the big toe. That's the next. Oh, you're, wor- you're yeah, working to sketch with your big one. toe. Yeah. Okay. I want to do that on the subway. I don't well, think anybody would, uh, would think that was weird. I'm pretty sure you, you get a video post online with uh, some random guy posting, <laughs> sketching with their toe. I think so. But yeah, we've had, we've had a lot of really thought provoking talks today. For sure. Um, for sure. And, you know, we also, uh, we're going to do this at the end, but we obviously, we want to really thank Purdue and the students here for bringing us out. Yeah. Um, You guys have been uh, like great hosts and uh, yeah, we're just like really thankful that we can do our second ever live pod. That's right. Yeah. And it's it's so much nicer with these big couches, man. I got to get some of these in my apartment. Yes. Uh. So, Nick, (laughs) what were we going to talk about today? Well, you know, we were talking about it today. We wanted to do something that was, you know, somewhat related to the Converge Conference. And, you know, we were listening to the amazing, these amazing speakers in the morning. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about startups and yeah. how, you know, when you're in companies, sometimes you have, you know, maybe there's stakeholders involved, people to decide on what the design should and shouldn't be. Um, but the startup lifestyle is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and actually, on our last podcast uh, with Reed Schlegel, Reed and I talked about in-house design versus consultancy design, but we really didn't touch on startups. Yeah, you know, the thing is, is that I feel like there is sort of this, you know, what's posed often to students is there's two routes, and maybe maybe there's maybe there's a third in freelance, but there's two routes. You can go in-house or you can go consultancy. And... I mean, when I was in school, I, this was sort of at the beginning of the startup boom. So I don't, I don't remember hearing a lot about that and knowing that that was an option or, you know, a possible career path. But right now, as a freelance industrial designer, most of the companies that I work for are startups. Yeah, and I guess maybe we needed to kind of define a startup because, you know, what is it, exactly is a startup? I mean sure businesses start all the time and there's big businesses that might have a more of a startup culture but from my experience a startup is 
a business that is that is just started and is growing at a rapid pace mm-hmm. usually that's yeah. that's usually what entails a startup because a flower shop your your mom opens a flower shop that's not a startup right yeah it usually has to do with i mean there's there's a, a lot of funding that's going behind these a lot startups of venture capital a lot, think, usually, usually a lot of tech yeah we're in the tech startup boom but I, I think the, the thing that really made me want to talk about this topic was during, uh, I think it was, and I hope I'm not getting his name wrong, Daniel Strang. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he was talking about how, how designers get in front of the CEO of a company to really, to really uh, you know, get it into the ear of that person to make decisions. Right. And um, I've worked at, I guess, four different startups at this point. And in each one of them, I've had interface, you know, almost daily with the CEO. Like this is, this is kind of a place where you can come in as a designer and affect, you know, you can, you can have a big effect on the culture, on the culture of design um, as this company is growing from the ground up. Can you disclose the startups or no? Yeah, of course. Because uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the ones you're thinking of, but I can't think of the fourth one. Yeah. Which ones have you so, worked So uh, I've worked at, the, my first in- internship was at Quirky, which if you didn't know, don't know what Quirky was, it was this sort of, uh, it was crowdsourcing ideas in a way. It was a community. People would submit ideas and the company would decide which ideas to move forward with and then produce. Um, it, was, it was awesome. I mean, I, that was kind of where I realized, you know, oh my gosh, in a company like this, design does have a seat at the table yeah. and you know a substantial seat. Uh, and then, so after I worked uh, corporate for a couple years, then I worked at Peloton, I worked at Bark & Co, and now Control Labs. Right, all the same places I've worked. Because <laughs> you've, you've let me in the door. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's, you know, kind of like what you're saying, it, startups are very small companies, usually. Um, it depends on where you where you are in their in their growth but because it's small you are presenting to the ceo you know yeah. you're presenting your concepts you are presenting the actual like products and it's interesting because not all ceos see the same way you know not right. they don't all value design in the same way yeah um I, I think about apple obviously steve valued design uh, tremendously um but we've been in scenarios where it's a little bit different um yeah and it's a challenge to c- talk with these higher up executives, trying to convince them of the value of design. Do you have any like thoughts on that? Like tips? Oh man. Well, I, I have a story and I'm not going to name the company, okay. but you know, I, one of my very first presentations at this startup, I was really nervous because the CEO, it has this incredible backstory. Right. And, um, you know, super smart guy. And, uh, you know, I was, I was pretty intimidated, but (laughs) what added to that intimidation factor was the fact that while I was presenting, this guy was circling the room, like with his head down and his eyes closed. And he was walking behind me as I'm, as I was presenting. And I was, I just was so nerd. And he would occasionally, when I would say a word, he would go, Hmm. Mm. Yeah. And, and I was like, I think that's a good thing. I think so. <laughs> Maybe. But it was it was very it was very nerve wracking. But you just kind of have to like stick to the presentation, stick to the storytelling. And the thing about working at a startup as a designer is like you know everything is an iterative process. So even your presentation to the CEO, like there's there's going to be some hiccups in the beginning. And you'll have a second chance for sure. Yes. Well, unless you fail completely and you just fired <laughs> you on the spot, for sure. And then you'll have to do work. That's right. As Rotimi. Our, that last, hey, last hey. Speaker. Uh, yeah. I think a, a key part of your story that you just said was the storytelling aspect of your presentation. Yeah. You, I, I find a lot of times when you are talking to someone who doesn't quite understand design, you really have to lay out that story yeah. and add that emotional connection to the design. Yeah. You know, you can't just get up there and, and be like, hey, here's my sketches. They're kind of just aesthetic variations. They all look cool. 
this one's my favorite. What do you think? You know, like that's not, that's not how you present to a CEO. Right. You have to start off saying, you know, I studied the company culture and, you know, I understand that you've started this in your garage and I wanted to implement some of those inspirations from, you know, the old arcade days when you told the story about how you were inspired by the arcade. And so you implement those design elements and really relate it to, you know, that the CEO or the executive's kind of um, emotion about the company, I think is a great way to connect your design to the to the CEO. Yeah, yeah. Understanding the CEO's backstory, because that's the, that's the really exciting part about startups is that they are often like, you know, started by people who are really enthusiastic about the product that they are bringing, you know, that they're bringing from nothing to the market. And so understanding that backstory and, and, you know, really embracing that backstory and almost like empathizing with, with the CEO to, to just like understand, like, how do I approach the way that I talk to this person about this product. It's a, it's a design problem in and, in and of itself, you know? Right. Um, what about, do you have any thoughts on like the drawbacks of the startup lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, obviously startups can be hectic at times. I mean, it is probably one of the more hectic work environments that you can be in if the startup doesn't kind of have everything buttoned up. Yes, yeah, for sure. And There's a lot of times we're like, oh, we don't have a printer or like (laughs) just like random things are missing. Like, you know, right. And so you kind of, that's the thing with, with uh, startups and and maybe it's similar to consultancies, but you kind of have to roll with the punches. Yeah. You gotta be flexible for sure. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is that, yeah, like, you know, job security is maybe not as secure at, at like a more established company or consultancy. Yeah. Um, But that kind of, it's it's also kind of the well I, I'm not gonna say jobs not having job security is exciting but but it's certainly like you know it, it kind of adds to kind of the the vibe of the startup which is like you it know, could go let's at any do second. It, let's do this now because we might not have right. another chance I, I think there's also and and this is maybe a pro for startups if you start and also, I kind of want to hear how you've gotten into these jobs, James. Like, you know, startups don't post online for industrial designers. Like, or maybe they do. Maybe there's a few. But a lot of times it's, you know, people in their garages, people starting out. There's not that, that process in, to getting into the startup world. But, um, oh, I was going to say something. What was I going to say? I have no okay. idea, Nick. Well, just, just, just tell me how. Just tell <laughs> we're me. not. Oh, wait, oh, we're not as connected cerebrally as you might think. <laughs> not yet. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, tell me how you got into startups. Why? Well, think of what I was actually going to say. Um, well, honestly, the first startup that I got into, I, I think I've told this story numerous times on the podcast, but um, I guess it bears repeating because we're in front of some new listeners. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I think you might all know Reed Schlegel. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. We went to school together and I was honestly just looking for a job. Like this was after graduating and hopefully for the seniors, this is an optimistic note. I did not have a single internship before I graduated from college, which was as frightening to me as it should be to you right now. Like in hearing this story, like I was scared and for myself, I was like, will I ever work in this industry? And, um, you know, I just I just put my head down and I was like, I'm I'm going to figure this out. And so I just, I mean, before before getting to read, I was just calling up firms and calling up companies. And this is something that we talked about on w- one of our previous podcasts. Is this idea of like, how do you move your portfolio up the stack of portfolios right. to get it in front of the right people? And one of the things that you can do, and this is something I learned from Tony Smith, was actually calling the place that you want to work just so they they hear your voice and there's more of a connection than just words in an email. Um, But anyway, so uh, yeah, eventually, um, you know, I really liked what Quirky was all about from hearing from Reed and, and asked if, you know, he could put in a recommendation for me. And that's another thing is like 
making good connections while you're in school with your classmates. Like, you know the people who do good work that are hard workers. Like, you see them in studio every day. Right. Um, so, you know, very grateful to read, you know, to set that up for me. And that's how I got involved at Quirky. So definitely through the connections. And I feel like that's, you've helped me connect really well in New York as well, James. Um, but I do remember what I was going to say. The pro, you were talking about how startup culture is a little bit volatile. You know, the company right. could go at any second. It could get sold. It could go under. Who knows? Um, but the pro to that is, is if you are one of those early employees that gets in there, you might have some uh, equity in the company. Oh, yeah. Which I would love to get one day. I got <laughs> I to gotta figure out how to get in there. But um, that is a pro of yeah. the startup lifestyle. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I guess Nick, you got, you got involved in startup when you, when you moved to New York. Yes. You helped me in the door, James. And, um, I, yeah, it's a different, it's definitely, I feel like every startup is different. You know, Absolutely. there, there are a lot of different types of startups and different stages of startups. Um, and I enjoyed them a lot because I feel like a lot of the young startup companies have like all the perks you got coffee on tap, you know, beer, <laughs> wine, LaCroix, just drinking oh, cases and LaCroix. cases of LaCroix. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think kind of like what we were talking about earlier, sometimes you have the power to make decisions that may not even be within your realm. Like right. you can reach beyond industrial design and make some more like mechanical decisions. Yeah, that that is cool. Recently I was asked to do sort of uh, the instructions, the illustrations for the instructions for a device that we're working on. And that was that was a lot of fun. Like I, you know, I got to I got to exercise something that I wouldn't necessarily do at another job at a bigger company where they have people working on that kind of stuff or they, you know, shop that out to somebody. I think, yeah, I think startups can be a great place for people who like to wear multiple hats. Yes. You if, know, if, if yeah. you enjoy doing that graphic design on the side, you know, maybe startup is a nice avenue to go. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I had something that I wanted to say and I'm trying to, oh, there's been a lot of talk at this conference, you know, w I, I noticed that there was a focus on sort of like uh, diversity within the design team, which, you know, is, is great. And it's great that we're talking about these things. And the great thing about a startup is if you are the first designer there or, you know, you're you and your boss, you're the only designers there, but you're building a team, you can build that team very deliberately. Um, you know, it's, that's, that is an honest perk about, about startups is you are, you're building a design team, you're building a process. That's true. You know, and you can sort of come into this and, and I'm not saying, you know, that you shouldn't start out at a startup. I, I had my first internship there, but then I worked corporate for three years. Working at a, working at a startup, you can come into that decision making with like, oh, you know, here are the things that didn't work at my last job. And here's what we can, what we could maybe do right. to fix that problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember, you know, working at my full, full time job and yeah, there was some weird like hurdles and things that you had to get through. Like I remember you would have to, I would have to make presentations and then, then give the presentation to one of the managers who would then present it to an, I didn't even get to present to the executives at my full-time job. Um, but yeah, like what you're saying, when you are the first one at a startup, I mean, you get to make those processes. You get to say like, oh, hey, this is how we, we present to the executive team, you know, or we, you know, we do sketches and then we do 3D renders or, or whatever it is. And I think that is a valuable key to being at a startup because you can build it from the ground up. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. No, it's, uh, I, I think that it needs to, because it seems to be more and more of a, of a thing we encounter, the whole startup thing is that I, I think that this needs to be more, you know, talked about within the design community as like, this could be a thing. I mean, I know people that have basically, you know, gone from startup to startup because that is, that is another thing about startups is eventually there's like sort of an A team and maybe it transforms into a B team. Yeah. But sometimes you might work at a startup for a couple of years and, and once the company is more established, you decide 
hey, I, you know, I think, I think I'm, I'm done here because because it, then it gets corporate. Then it gets corporate. Yeah, you, you can't talk to the CEO anymore. Yeah, and you, you are right. Like startups do have that life cycle of, hey, there's three people in the garage, and then there's ten people, and then eventually, you know, you get a lot of funding and investors, and then at a certain point, you got to pay back the investors. Right, and that that comes through selling to out to other companies or you know going to the stock market or whatever it is um yeah i i was thinking about um the different teams and things i have you like been on a core team that has like traveled around to different startups i would say that i have definitely um i mean so far in my career i guess just like a, a manager going from one place to another okay and and bringing me in okay so it's um, again like connect connections but yeah connections. i mean it just it just speaks to the networking thing which is you know just go go into your job do work do really you know make a good impression at the job that you're that you're at that you get right and you never know what kind of opportunities are coming around the corner from you know it, I don't know. Yeah, I really liked Rotimi's uh, presentation, um, and you know, I we can talk about it briefly. But you know, the entire idea of doing work, yeah, and that's that's the main focus is key because that leads to everything else, right? Right. You do the work, and once you show the work, people are like, "Oh, hey, that's cool stuff. Can I give you a job?" Or like, "Hey, I want to work on something with you." And I think a lot of times we. We do the work and then we kind of sit back and, and maybe try to search for opportunities and nothing's quite working out. But we really need to just keep going. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing is, is like, um, it's funny because right now I'm taking the Instagram hiatus. Yeah. But how's I, that going, James? <laughs> Can we update everyone? On it's, it? I mean, it's been pretty spectacular. Have you been off of Instagram for two months now? Yeah, something like that. I have been getting the itch to to get back into okay. it. Oh, and just to be fair, you do have Instagram on your iPad, so you can check it once like a day yes. or something. But it's not as convenient as yeah. On your phone. You don't you don't just you don't just whip out your iPad right. casually and check right. Instagram. It's not it's I mean, not as easy. I've seen you do it once or twice, <laughs> but yeah. It's like the person, you know, it's like the person taking photos with the iPad. Oh. It's just like, there's just something not quite right about yeah, that's it. That's horrible. But, um, but, uh, oh, what was, what was We're I? talking about your Instagram. Hiatus. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing is like, I mean, obviously I, I would say probably most of you know who Nick is, you know, right? Show of hands. Who, who knew Nick before he got here? There's All no, right. oh, one person. Was <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, the way that I got familiar with Nick and Nick's work was through his Instagram. And I was like, this kid is super talented, like can generate really unique ideas. And like, this was even before seeing his portfolio, like this was through the Instagram. And I also got a sense of like the type of person he was and the type of person that he would be to work with. And it's like, you know, that's why when Nick is like, hey, I'm coming to New York and I'm like, I, th I think there's a position somewhere that I can set you up with because I'm confident that you would be able to do this. I yeah. mean, you know, there, there are obviously drawbacks to Instagram and there, but there are great benefits, yeah. which is showing that side of yourself that nobody's going to see through a portfolio or an interview. I think, yeah, I think that's great. Um, do we... Do we have any thoughts on startups? Any more thoughts? Are we, huh? Should we answer some questions? I think, we should, I think we should get to some questions. Okay. I hope you guys have been thinking of questions. Yeah. I mean, and, and to be clear, they don't have to be about startups. They can be about anything they design. They can be about anything design related. Uh, but we just wanted to talk about startups today. Yeah. Questions? And do we have another microphone for the question askers? Yes. That's good. So the, the question was, uh, is there a point in a startup where 
you can wear too many hats and possibly, let me re rephrase this and make sure that's okay, possibly that could be a detriment to, to, the, to, your, to the quality of design. Right. Yeah, and, and I think that that's, that's a situation where, you know, there's obviously, like we were saying, not every startup is made the same and some of them can have sort of like maybe a toxic kind of work environment. And that's kind of where you have to be like, you know, is this, is this worth it? Can I find any sort of silver lining in this? Or, or is it just taking too much away from me and, and there's no benefit to, to me um, in yeah, that situation? I, I do think it's very situational. But I would say I think maybe the one tip for that is if you are in the situation where you feel like you're wearing too many hats, maybe that's the time where you need to go to your manager or whoever's in charge and say, hey, you know, I, you know, can we outsource some of this work or can, right. we, can we bring another person in to help out with that? Um, because like, it's, it's becoming a detriment to the, to the quality of the product. And I think if you phrase it in a way that communicates well to you know, whoever your manager is, I think there's a conversation to happen there. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. Yes. Ooh. Oh yeah. So the question was, uh, have we ever had a project given to us that we didn't really care for and then decided to turn it into something awesome? Nick, I feel like you have a story. I have plenty. Of, yeah. I, <laughs> working in the pet industry, there have been many projects that are not exciting at all. Uh, specifically litter boxes. I don't think anyone wants to design a litter box. Um, and yeah, I, it, it's easy to get discouraged when your boss comes to you and you're like, and, and is like, hey, can you design this this little cat toy that just doesn't do anything and just lays on the ground? And you're like, oh man, but the world is just filled with plastic, and what am I doing with my life? You know, it's like it's like that kind of thing. Um, but specifically with my litter box project, you know, litter boxes aren't sexy. No one's gonna go off and show a litter box in their portfolio. But <laughs> you flip that around. You flip that around and use it to your advantage and say, what if I made a litter box so good that I'd be proud to show it off in my portfolio? And so that was one of the projects I worked on was uh, I actually designed like 10 or so litter boxes, too many litter boxes, honestly. I don't think there's enough cats in the world. <laughs> there's so, not enough litter in the world. No, 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 right, exactly. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I designed some litter boxes that I'm really proud of. I I mentioned my volcano litter box often. If you listen to the podcast, it's like a volcano shape. It comes up, and then it's just very simple, clean and design. And it kills your cat. No, it doesn't. In no. Liquid hot magma. <laughs> James. <laughs> oh man. Um, and and yeah, it's it's one of those projects where it's like you take something that is that is not exciting, but you have the power. I always say like the person with the pen has the power. You know, you get to design that project to be awesome. Yeah, the topic may not be the most exciting thing. You might not be doing the new, you know, Mustang or Ferrari, but hey, you still have the power to make it an amazing design. Absolutely. I want to hear if you've ever worked on a project that you were like, oh, but then turned it around. Mm. Can well, you think of anything? I'm, I'm trying to think. I, I, I mean, I think that in general... I try to find the point of view like of a project that nobody else is, th is necessarily thinking about. So I, I try to approach almost every project like that. And I, I don't, I guess I have an example of a project where I wasn't necessarily assigned it, but I ended up taking it on. Oh, so someone else started it? Well, it was kind of being like passed around the department. So this was back when I was at Lifetime Brands. And there was this project. They wanted to design some self-leveling measuring spoons okay. for KitchenAid. Mm -hmm. And this project was being passed from designer to designer. And it was just kind of like... Because, because no one wanted to do, to do it? Nobody really... It just seemed like nobody really wanted to do it. Nobody mm -hmm. was that interested. Okay. And I was just kind of like... Uh, I was between projects. And, and my manager was said to me, you know, do you want to take a stab at this? 
And so I thought it was a really interesting project and, and uh, took it on and um, yada, 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 got a utility patent for Ooh, it. Oh, utility patent. Yeah. That's the good kind of patent. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, I was really happy that I got a chance to work on something and, and that resulted in, in something that I couldn't have even imagined, which was to get my first utility patent. Yeah, that's awesome. So I also, there's another note that I'm thinking of in terms of projects that you're not really excited about. I think there's always a part of the project that you can be excited about. So maybe, you know, instead of it, instead of like doing litter boxes and, you know, not liking litter boxes, maybe it is like something, something that maybe is cool, but like the part, the process isn't the exciting part or, or is the exciting part. Like think about if you really like key shot rendering, maybe that's the part that you focus on. Mm. Maybe that's the skill you really want to focus on and that you're excited about for that particular project. Yeah. Or, or maybe a, a project comes to you and you want to learn a new skill. This, you did read my mind that time. I did? Is that what you yeah. said? Um, this happened to me at, at PetMate when I was designing dog toys. There was a dog toy brand called Dogzilla, and you can see it on my website. Um, and... Dogzilla is all about like funky shapes and like, you know, dinosaurs and things like that. And so it was kind of like a crazy, you know, it's not like I'm designing the iPhone, right? Like there's no sleek things about this thing. Um, so I took it upon myself and I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Rhino and Grasshopper. Those are 3D modeling softwares. Um, and Grasshopper specifically is algorithmic based. Mm -hmm. um, so you can create you know, these algorithms and kind of like plug and play different like f feature trees, I don't even know what you call them. It's very like complex, but you can create very crazy organic shapes. And so, you know, I took this, this prompt, this design brief of designing these, you know, organic dog toys and was like, hey boss, like, I think this would be awesome if I could use the software to design these toys that I had no idea how to use at all. Um, so that's what I did. I spent the extra time and put in the hours to learn software while I designed the product. Um, so that's another technique you can use if you are not super excited about the project. That's great. Uh, do we have another question? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the question was, uh, we mentioned networking is a key part, especially maybe possibly getting into startup culture. Networking is, is important. But in school, is it beneficial to network with other students outside of design, possibly engineers or, you know, whatever major? That, I never thought about that. I've never thought about I that either. I love that outside-the-box thinking. I mean, I went to a school that was a pure art school. We didn't have engineering. Um, so I don't, I never like networked outside of that art sphere. But certainly there are people that went on to do like fibers and textiles and, and projects that weren't really industrial design based that I have still kept in touch with. Mm -hmm. And it, it has, I believe it's led to a few like small projects here and there of like, oh, hey, you know, my accessory friend did a backpack and then, you know, they had a new client come in that wanted a backpack. So I sketched up some backpacks and things like that. Right. That's a, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Thoughts? I, I think, um, I really think that, and I don't know how it is at Purdue, but I just remember my time at Virginia Tech thinking that, you know, it was a missed opportunity. The fact that we didn't more regularly collaborate with the engineering school and with the business school. It seems like a no brainer, honestly. Yeah. Like I, if you want to like emulate the workforce. Yeah. To cultivate and to also cultivate appreciation for the different disciplines yeah. at that age. Yeah. I feel like a lot of times designers are get into the zone of like design is the most important. Right. Which 
it's important. Yeah, I think you. I think you. But there's need. value in there's value in engineering <laughs> and and business as well. Yeah, I think I think it's good to know know the language. I think Paul Sohi talked about this on our podcast. Was you know learning the language of of engineering to be able to talk to engineers. Yeah. Um, you know, we kind of talked about with the startup, like learning, learning the language of your CEO right. uh, to get decisions made. I, I wish that there had been more of that kind of collaboration early on at school. I, I will say, I believe there are schools out there that do have some sort of program like this. Yeah. I, I've definitely heard of it and I know it's like a, a common thing, but it just, it feels like when I was in school, we didn't have it at all. Right. Yeah. I don't know. But I, I think that's really interesting, and if that's an impulse that you have to go and make some of those relationships, I would say go for it. For sure. Yeah. If it's natural, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. So, kind of paraphrase that, you know, have we ever ran into a scenario where we worked with a client that maybe didn't necessarily have a like a specific deliverable or a set goal, more of just kind of an idea and we started the project and maybe it was a lot more than we had actually quoted for. Um Yeah, I so I've certainly made this mistake of like, oh, this is how much the project will cost and then have gone down the rabbit hole of, oh crap, I've put way too much time into this project and now I've made $6 an hour. <laughs> you know, like that's the <laughs> equivalent. Um, but I also will say, now that I've kind of learned from that, I have started to, you know, it's, it's, it's a process, right? Like you, you slowly learn how to price yourself with these projects. And you learn kind of different, different clients' needs and, and what they, you know, what they're kind of looking for. A lot of times, all they really need is just something on the table to talk about, especially at those first beginning stages, because I feel like that's where it's the most ambiguous. You know, you have the startup guy that comes and he wants to do the Kickstarter product, and they're like, hey, I want to make a water bottle. And you're like, okay, let's make a water bottle. And, it, and you know, they don't really know what they want until you show them a sketch. Um, and you know, there's two. There's many ways to go about it. Um, I prefer to price out my projects based on based on the, the project itself. So like one big uh, uh, price. But I've also done hourly, and that might be a better solution as well. If you want to just charge hourly and say, hey, you know, this these renders might estimate. Uh, I might estimate they they take like ten hours. Um, and then at the 10 hour mark, you can, you can just email your client and be like, oh, hey, I actually had to edit some of the 3D models and it's going to take a little bit longer. Is that okay? You know, I think it's, it's a lot about communication. Yeah, I think, it, and I think in that situation, oh, I think my mic is dead. I think in that situation, um, I think, yeah, like as, as soon as you can alert your client to, to the fact that... Um, that you're having, you're gonna have to do this extra work, the better. Yeah. Like you don't wanna come to the end and be like, and I worked 48 more hours than I thought. Definitely don't do that. And this is how much it's gonna cost. I, th I think if you can start that communication process early, and also I, on all of my quotes, I put, I put subject to change. You Ooh, know, that's like smart. I, you know, I add in that clause based on like, I, I don't know, because this is, this is as ambiguous to me as it is to you. And right. so I'm, I'm estimating that it's going to take me this much time. Yeah. I actually have a project right now that's due on Monday that I haven't started yet, but I, I'll get to it. <laughs> um, oh, God. All right. Let's start the brainstorming right now. Uh, can we get a whiteboard out here? Oh, okay. <laughs> Multitask. Um, and yeah, my, my client has this vision for this kind of, it's, it's a large vision and we're just starting out and it's, there's a lot of like 
there's some wearable tech in there and and other other aspects of that a lot of products and he doesn't really know what they he wants so i said hey i'm just going to start sketching up what i envision right and that's just like a starting off point but but you have to remember like make sure you log those hours like i met with a client for 2 hours those are billable hours so you know make sure you add all your hours in and just make be transparent about your hours and and how you're getting paid yeah great question thank you uh another question Oh man, this is a good question. The risks and benefits of posting your work online and possibly getting stolen. Yeah. You know, I get heated about this topic. <laughs> this uh, get fired up. So, so I, I'm not sure how, how, how many people are familiar with this story. I, I believe there's a podcast episode, like we talked about it really early on, episode two or something, where my nightlight that I designed in school got ripped off on Alibaba. Um, I had designed it, posted it on Behance, and then I think it was a while later, it was maybe like a year later, I was coincidentally just scrolling through Alibaba like I do. That's my... (laughs) (laughs) As you do. Friday night activity, you know. Um, And I saw my light. They were using my exact photos. And I was like, okay, well maybe they just like ripped my photos off my website and put it up there to see if there's any interest. But then the last photo had a, they had a picture of their prototype that they made. And so like they had literally taken my light and copied it. Uh, it wasn't as good. It didn't have the divot. There's like a little divot on it, which was mm. anyways. Yeah. Crazy story. I didn't know what to do. So I just posted on the Corey 77, uh, forums online and it actually got turned into a blog post. So it was posted on the blog and I got a lot of people contacting me, like lawyers were calling me up, be like, hey, like, how can I help? And um, long story short, I think the exposure that I gained and the story that I gained from that was more valuable than just the cash that I would have made trying to get it produced. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very strong on the aspect that the value of putting your projects out there greatly outweighs the risk that there's some off chance that you've created a new type of electricity and that you're going to get, it's going to be stolen. Like that, we love our ideas. We think there are little babies, but ideas are a dime a dozen. The hard part is executing. Yeah. And if someone wants to go and take your idea and execute on it, like honestly, props to them. Like they, they put in the hard work. Hmm. That's sorry. I just (laughs) close to my heart. Yeah, could you stop screaming, Nick? We'd all appreciate it. Um, no, but I think uh, I think it is it is a really interesting question, and and I'll just I'll just sort of um, harken back to something that I was talking about earlier, which is if Nick wasn't on Instagram posting his ideas and taking that risk, I would have never seen his work. I would and, definitely still be in Texas for yeah, sure. Yeah, and and I think that it opened a lot of doors for you know for nick to make his way to new york and to have a reputation coming into it um the the other thing is is that we're one of the magical parts about the age in which we're living in is there is you can put a lot of pressure onto a company as customers and as people on social media if somebody rips off a design just watch, like I've seen it happen with graphic designers, just watch the mob of people descend upon that company. And, yeah. that, and that company more often than not ends up like bowing to the, right. the demands because the like they social, don't want social that media, bad press. Yeah, social media shaming is like a new, yeah. a new, a whole new like monster. A whole new world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that, you know, that could very well happen if if somebody rips off the great part about it is if somebody rips off your design and starts producing it yeah they did all that work and then your design gets made and <laughs> i can you, buy one <laughs> if you play your cards right you could get royalties on that design yeah i don't yeah i mean that scenario that might be hard but <laughs> I, I i do want to say one thing that i did change after my lamp got knocked off and 
I specifically on a lot of my projects that are like self-produced, um, like I, I produced a mirror, a, a Ben mirror for a, my brand called Almost Object. Um, and the moment I released it was also the moment that you could buy it. So that was the mistake I made with the lamp is that once I put my lamp online, no one could buy it, but there was a high demand for it. I feel like if people could have bought it right then and there, no one would have knocked it off because, oh, like well, it's already being sold. I'm not going to try to like take some of the profits from that. Yeah. But when you can't buy it, that's the, yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing. I just definitely still believe that the value is putting your work out there, right. especially as a student. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yeah. That's a great question. Right. And, and the question was, how do we curate our online presence, most likely on Instagram, but other platforms, and, and kind of juxtapos juxtaposition that with our portfolios themselves? Yeah. Nick, I feel like you're the, you're the portfolio king. I, <laughs> I'm the portfolio king. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of websites. I, I like my website portfolio. I think it just looks a lot more professional than a PDF portfolio. Um, and I, I would hope that every company that I sent my portfolio to would be in you know 2019 and not have to like print out a PDF. I don't really, I'm a big fan of websites. Um, <laughs> every company is different, but that's what I like. And you know, how do I show my personality through my website as opposed to my Instagram? You know, I would say it's definitely evolved specifically now that I'm more independent as a designer and not necessarily looking for a full-time job. Um, I know a lot of people do split up their Instagram from student work to their personal life, like have two separate profiles. I've always just had one profile, mainly because design is my life <laughs> and that's all I can, all I do and think about. Um, and, and yeah, I, there's definitely like, the whole Instagram thing, I think, is there's a lot of pressure to post, and there is a, a lot of anxiety about, like, oh, well, people like my work and things like that. I've always framed it as Instagram is a place for me to experiment and try new things. And if someone doesn't like it, okay. Like, you know, you have to get past that. Um, and don't worry about that part. The, the best part about it is that it's a place where I learned something. It's a place where I tried a new technique and posted about it. And sometimes that pays off, like the VR sketching. And sometimes it doesn't. Like I did a lot of woodworking in Texas. And like I don't do that. Well, I also don't have a lot of woodworking tools anymore. But right. I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think your portfolio is, is definitely the place to put your best foot forward. Like what, what, is, what does your best look like? Your best storytelling, your best sketching, your best model making and definitely if you're putting something out there for an employer to see portfolio is what you should do yeah like i would never send a, a employer my instagram but my instagram is connected to my website yeah so if they dug deep they could find it if they wanted yeah but it's not the focus right yeah but i i would say for for curating instagram i mean i don't know about you nick but i i can't say that i ever really had a deliberate plan about the way that I was trying to curate it it just kind of it just kind of emerged over time yeah like what made sense for me was like that was an iterative process of of posting and just like you know and and, and yeah just like what do I want to post what do I want to focus in on I kind of uh, like that because it's like a timeline of your life right like when you scroll back all the way back down, it's like, oh, you know, I'm posting pictures of, like, me camping and, like, just doing, like, fun things. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a great question. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah. Did we answer the question? <laughs> okay. I felt like it was kind of answered. <laughs> I don't know if I, I it was, yeah. <laughs> any, any more questions? Any more questions? Oh, yeah. How do you start The, so the question was, 
have we ever worked in a place where people don't know about industrial design? Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, okay, so I, I've seen this happen. I've, I've gone into places where there's, it's, they've just started a hardware team. They've just started industrial design. And there is, there is a presentation to the company. This is industrial design. Oh, that's funny. Which is like, it's kind of amazing and kind of great because, because like I have found more often than not when you start talking about industrial design to people who, who have never experienced it before, their eyes light up and they get super excited and They're they like, just want to like, you know, ask you a bunch of questions about it. And it is, it is just like, it's, you, you can kind of work to bring that understanding to the company that you're working at. Yeah, I think that's, that's good advice. Do a yeah. presentation. Yeah, do a presentation and uh, don't hold back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Steve, also for, for inviting us and everything for, yeah. the, for the conference. Uh, why should we care who Dieter Roms is? Oh, man. This is... Okay, this I think is, it would be a shorter a answer hang on, hang on, to say, why shouldn't we care? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> so I found this quite amusing. James and I, we landed yesterday. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we got picked up by some students. Thank you guys for driving us from the airport to here. And, you know, we, we met with Steve, the chair, the chair, head, chair, head, uh, the, the man, the man, the man in charge of IDSA program at Purdue. And, you know, uh, not necessarily understanding all the, the new Instagram technology and all that, you know, had to, had to research us to make sure that we were legit <laughs> and said like, Oh, Hey, yeah, I saw some YouTube. Are you guys YouTubers found some YouTube videos? Yeah. Um, so it's like, it's funny to think about, you know, we are very much ingrained in the online culture, but there is an entire culture beyond online. And sometimes we'd need to step back and look back at the history. Right. And just really research the old and, you know, prolific designers. Yeah. And, and Nick, but the question was, why should we care who Dieter Rams is? Well, he, he is the most famous industrial designer. He revolutionized industrial design from, you know, taking away all the extraneous decorative elements and, and really focusing on the usability and being honest to what the product is. Yeah, he really boiled the products down to the essence and used the materials in an honest way. Yeah. And, and in a way, during the time that he was, was coming up um, and, you know, started at Braun. I mean, this was po post-war Germany. And so Germany had a huge PR, you know, th scandal on their hands. Yeah. How sure. how do we reframe? And how do you how do you rebrand? How do we rebrand German yeah. Germany? And I would say that Dieter Rams and Braun was a part of that, mm -hmm. and a part of bringing quality design and emerging technologies into the hands of people. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I don't want to like call any names, but there was one student that walked out to me the other day and said, "Hey, I I, I know you guys. I'm really a big fan." And then we got talking about design, and I was like, yeah, you know, Dieter Rams. And they were like, oh, who? <laughs> and I was like, Dieter Rams, you know, Dieter Rams. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what that says about, about the, the culture today, but, like, they know us, <laughs> but not Dieter kids. Rams. <laughs> um, no, it's... I don't know, just a good juxtaposition. Yeah. But I don't know. It's, it's an interesting, interesting yeah. topic. Yeah. But uh, I think... I don't know, Nick, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, one, one last question. I, th I think I saw a hand over here. Mm. Oh, man. That's a... 
Yeah. That, that is a great question. The, the question was, you know, we put so much effort into visually communicating our ideas, but we forget about talking about our ideas. And sitting here right now, thinking about how I'm talking on this podcast, I'm starting to like, uh-oh, am I saying the right things? <laughs> <laughs> this is funny because recently I got a message on Instagram because I check it once a day. Uh, I, got an, I got a message that said, James, I really love the podcast. I love what you have to say, but you have to stop saying like. And, and this person like really just laid me out for saying Dang. like as much as I do. Dang. And, you know, I honestly, I'm really thankful for that person because communication, verbal communication is incredibly important. And coming across that you are confident in the, the designs and the decisions that you've made, uh, this, this, is, this is what we have to do. This is what we have to do when we meet with that CEO or we meet with our design team. Speaking clearly and concisely, I mean, it is amazing how impactful that can be. For sure. Um, I will give a tip. If you guys are ever presenting or something, make sure you practice your presentation. There, I, mean, I know it sounds like silly, like, oh, like, you know, whatever. But even for, like, small presentations, like, if you are presenting your project to the class, you know, take, and it helps if you do it the night before. Because if you take, you know, an hour the night before to run through your slideshow and just present in an empty room, speaking out loud, make sure you speak out loud, um, you'll sleep on it, and it'll all kind of get memorized into your brain so that when you present the next day, you are so much more confident because you know the material, you know the slides, and you can present in a, a more, I don't know, eloquent way, I guess. Yeah. You know, the, the other advice that is like the stereotypical like advice is, well, when you're pre presenting is to picture the audience naked. Oh, right. Has anybody ever actually done that? I don't, Nick. Well, I mean, now that you said it, Nick, I'm thinking about oh, it. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> no, I'm just, I, I, I've never heard of anybody being like, and it worked for me. Like I, oh, you know, that's true. I don't know. I don't feel like it works at all. No, I, I don't understand. Oh, this. there's another tip too. I, oh, the, what's this one? If you ever, are, this one's good for if you're going into an interview or something, apparently someone did, did some research. Someone did some research. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't fact check me. Someone somewhere out there. And, and they said, if you stand up and do the Superman pose, you know, like, <laughs> and and just and just you know you do the superman pose in the mirror and then you tell yourself like oh i'm going to do an amazing job and just doing that in the middle of the interview no 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 you do it before you do it before <laughs> okay you do it like the morning before right <laughs> and doing that actually boosts your confidence that's the that's the one article it was probably an article on it it was probably like a buzzfeed article yeah i do it yeah, absolutely. it's a mental thing. It's a mental thing. Yeah, but um, I think that's all the time we have for today for questions. We want to thank you all for the questions that you had. Yes, uh, and we we really want to give a special shout out to uh, the students that made this conference possible. Yeah, thank and you so guys. can we give them a round of applause and have them stand up and be recognized, like AJ and Hannah and Jack and and Malika and. I mean, this, this was awesome, and we really... And I also to Franz and Simon for picking us up at right, the airport. Right. Hey, here's a networking tip. If you have the opportunity to go pick up a professional at the airport, do it. Networking. Yeah. Um, and yeah, really, really happy that we were able to come out here and do our second ever live podcast, and thank you so much for having us. Yeah, and also, if you guys want to learn more or listen to the podcast, if you haven't before... Check us out, Minor Details, on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, all, all the platforms that have podcasting, we're on there. Give, yeah. it, give us a like and yeah. subscribe. Like, subscribe, comment. We also have a Discord. Oh, yes, a Discord. Because, you know, we're just two guys sitting up here chatting. Yes. So we, we have some answers. They, not be, they might not be the right answers. They might not even be good answers. But <laughs> we, wanna, we, we love interacting with our audience and hearing their perspectives on things. Yeah, so the Discord is basically like a, an open chat. Yes. Um, so we've got about 200 people in there now. So. I think so. Yeah, come on in there and share your work, share your ideas. I, I'm, continue I'm the conversation. Always, I'm always on the Discord, and I also post like some of my like 
personal projects that I'm working on. Yeah. That, that doesn't even get to post to Instagram. It's just like some fun stuff I'm doing. Those are called Discord yeah, so if you, perks. Discord perks. Yeah. Um, but of course, you can find everything on myrondetailspodcast.com. If you have an email, uh, a question, you can email to myrondetailspodcast at gmail.com. And, and yeah, what else? We got anything and else? the voicemail. Oh, we have a voicemail. Google <laughs> voicemail. Um, on our other podcasts, we do a voicemail recording where we listen to people who ask questions. Yeah, um, so you call in, you leave a question voicemail, and we'll play it on the podcast. Almost guaranteed that you will get played because we only get one voicemail a week. Yep, yep. Yeah, so. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for coming out um, and listening. Yes, thank you. Peace out. Later. Later.